Welcome everybody and thanks for joining. We'll be starting in about another minute as we let people come into the room. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. My name is Jonathan, and I'm one of the student leads of the urban learning community here at the Yale School of the Environment. And we're excited to co-sponsor today's session, as well as the entire webinar series on sustainable municipalities, innovative practices, and emerging trends in the U.S with the Hickson Center for Urban and Ecology, Sustainable CT, and the Sustainable States Network. Today's webinar is the fifth in our five spark spring series and our topic is eco-districts. We're gonna hear from Yale professor David Corris and two community examples. We'll have a little time after each speaker and more time after all three presentations to answer any questions you might have. If you have any questions at all, please type your questions into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen and I will ask the presenters to reply. So to begin our today's session, we'll hear from David Corris. David is the director of Rebuild by Design and National Disaster Resilience for the state of Connecticut. These federal grants totaling $65 million will enable resilience planning for Fairfield and New Haven counties and the construction of several pilot projects for green infrastructure, raised mobility corridors, distributed energy generation, and 21st century flood protection in Bridgeport. Prior to this position, Mr. Corris was director of the Office of Planning and Economic Development for Bridgeport, Connecticut's, uh, for Bridgeport, Connecticut. For assuming that appointment, Mr. Corris held various positions at the Regional Plan, Regional Plan Association in the New York Tri-State area, culminating in his role as vice president. And in addition to his various planning and management roles in the states, Mr. Corris has worked on high-speed rail-oriented development, sustainable planning, and urban revitalization projects abroad in eight countries across five continents. Since the fall semester of 2012, Mr. Corris has been a lecturer in city and regional planning practice at our Yale School of the Environment. Now I'm gonna hand it off to David. Great, thanks so much, Jonathan. And uh, thanks to the Hickson Center and Sustainable CT and the Sustainable States uh, Consortium for bringing this together. Um, I guess I changed jobs too, too regularly because since that bio, I was deputy commissioner of economic development for the state and, and now run Stanford downtown which is a special taxing district um, that covers the urban core of uh, the city in Southwestern uh, Connecticut. And I think that's relevant because, you know, the importance of the district scale, I think is emerging as we move towards sort of a new localism for planning um, throughout the country. I think particularly with a focus on sustainability and resilience, there's been a rising recognition over the last, you know, decade, decade and a half that you know, focusing exclusively on the building or the site level um, has limitations and we can't achieve the outcomes that we're looking to achieve as we prepare our communities for the challenges and, and opportunities that we face in the 21st century if we're limiting ourselves um, to our parcel boundaries. And it takes that collaboration and coordination and alignment um, at the district scale uh, to really achieve uh, the results that we're looking to achieve. Uh, before handing it over to um, to Kevin, Mary Ellen, and Megan to talk about some some case studies um, that they're going to walk us through, I wanted to just share some sort of broad principles from my experience working, uh, you know, managing this district here in Stanford, um, and then from my time as deputy commissioner at the state, um, and then my time working in other cities and towns that I think you'll hear are consistent throughout these case studies and, and hopefully will provide some replicable lessons learned for the communities that, that you all work in. You know, I think first and foremost, um, you know, we've realized that, you know, we have to work across sectoral boundaries, across governmental departments and, and even across levels of government. You know, when we work to achieve results at the district scale, 
it can't be government alone. It needs to be a partnership between government and the private sector, uh, between the public sector and, and the civic sector, all kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, similarly, uh, those of us that have been in local government know that, you know, breaking down those silos between operations and public works, planning and economic development, you know, public health, education um, is really the only way to achieve not only the synergies, um, but also that kind of policy whole that's greater than the sum of the parts that, that departments are, are not able to achieve on their own. Um, and while the district is, I believe, the appropriate scale to be thinking about sustainability, re resilience, uh, and eco more broadly, you know, oftentimes it does require coordination with the state or even the federal government, counties in, in those states, the other 49 that have them, um, you know, because oftentimes municipalities and, and local entities are constrained or enabled by the policy framework that they live within and, and often advocating to those higher levels of governments is a crucial component. Similarly, partnering with governments uh, adjacent, you know, physically contiguous to your own, you know, the issues that we're dealing with uh, don't respect political boundaries. They don't stop at the borderline. And so those partnerships uh, with, with adjacent municipalities, cities and towns or, or rural areas um, is, often, is often crucial. To achieve those results, robust and meaningful engagement is, is crucial. And, and I think you'll hear from these case studies, and, and certainly I've learned in, in my work, that you, know, you have to go out to folks early and often. Um, and the, the most meaningful uh, engagement is achieved when you begin to demonstrate to the diverse stakeholders that participate in the decision-making process the way in which their ideas are getting incorporated into your plans, into your priorities. Um, and, and being able to demonstrate that positive feedback loop so people see uh, that, um, you know, the, the impact of their, of their involvement and that encourages them to stay engaged and to, and to, stay, to stay with it. Um, you know, the next point that I, that I bring to in, in terms of that engagement is, is prioritization. You know, so oftentimes it's, it's easy to come up with the laundry list of activities that we could pursue. It's difficult to, to hone that list into those that are both achievable and create the greatest near-term results and, and build uh, and compound results that lead to future success. And so I think what's crucial is, you know, not just bringing together a lot of great minds across sectors, across, um, you know, different areas of interest to come up with the, with the list of things that could possibly per be pursued, but then it's working together to prioritize and to focus resources um, on those things that, that create the greatest near-term results. Next point that I would lead to is, is around financing. You know, I think we often struggle with identifying the resources necessary with local governments and private sector property owners, you know, with already so many things on their list that, that require the resource allocation and, and funding that you know, we often find ourselves looking for a resilience pot of money or a sustainability pot of money. And while those do sometimes come up, whether it's you know, federal programs or state programs or, or more local initiatives, um, you know, where I've seen the greatest success is incorporating it into the existing decision-making process around allocation of resources, whether it's rolling sustainability and resilience into uh, the vetting process for capital projects, or whether it's rolling it into the budgeting process that takes place every year, um, it, helping building owners incorporate it into their annual maintenance and capital planning process. And in doing so, not only can you identify existing resources that can be more effectively purposed towards the objectives of an eco district, but you can also better understand the relationship between the upfront investments and the near and long-term return, enabling you to find that better uh, cost-benefit ratio that enables you to prioritize the investments that lead to a three-year payback or a five-year payback so that the community or the district has even more resources to invest in other things going forward. Finally, I, I've alluded a lot to kind of mitigation and adaptation and resilience um, as sort of these overarching objectives of eco districts. And I, and I think the final point that I'd like to make is just that there's this never ending um, kind of give and take between you know, allocating resources towards mitigation to avoid the most significant climate impacts down the road, while at the same time recognizing that some number of these impacts are baked in and we have to find ways to adapt and become more resilient 
to the changes that we will undoubtedly see in the coming years. And I think it's important to marry those two conversations together um, because an exclusive focus on resilience uh, or adaptation may uh, abandon investments or assets that exist here today that we can still reap benefits from. Similarly, uh, an, an undue focus on uh, mitigation may you know, refuse to acknowledge or neglect to acknowledge the very real impacts that we're gonna to have to come to terms with uh, over the coming years. And so oftentimes by bringing those conversations together, you can have much more of a robust feedback loop with the various stakeholders that you engage in this process um, that helps you navigate that, uh, that course that's right for your community and for your district that allows you to map out the changes and the policies and the investments that need to be made not just on the three to five year horizon, but on the 10 to 20 year horizon and how they work together to ensure that the community has the resources necessary at the time at which the investment is needed um, and, is, and is continually moving forward uh, to position itself for prosperity, equity, and, and sustain, sustainability in these middle decades of the 21st century. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, David. Just as a reminder for all the listeners out there, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask uh, questions live. So we'll give a second for anyone to ask any questions. Otherwise I can start with the first one. So David, oftentimes the, the buck stops with elected officials in the government sector. And many times they have to produce immediate results, at least in these elected terms, or at least think about the next election cycle. What might you highlight uh, to, pursue, to persuade political figures to pursue the long-term goals of an eco-district? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we obviously have this conflict right now between long-range thinking and the four-year, two-year political horizon and, and even the quarterly horizon of you know, business returns. But I think um, when, when thought about comprehensively and when engaging a variety of stakeholders, you will see how the investments you need to make for 20 years out dovetail with the investments that you need to make or the policy decisions you need to make to, for tomorrow. And I think the key is just constantly being, uh, you know, uh, focused on all of those simultaneously. When I was in Bridgeport, for example, you know, we, we could never divorce the conversation around, you know, attracting renewable energy technology that would diversify our local grid looking out 10 years while simultaneously partnering with firms that could bring weatherization to homeowners and renters so that their energy bills could be reduced tomorrow. And it's constantly you know, thinking about all those things together so that people see both immediate results, but those immediate results uh, res um, you know, result in more resources being available to the community at large so that you can make those investments that lead to the long-term impacts. If that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So uh, just a reminder for everyone else, again, feel free to send in your questions in the chat. Um, and I'll get back to any questions by the end of our presentations. Thank you, David. All right. Our next speaker is joining us from Rochester, Minnesota, Kevin Bright is a certified energy manager, lead fellow, and lead accredited professional in building design and construction, as well as operations and maintenance. And he's the energy and sustainability director for the Destination Medical Center, Economic Development Agency, and the city of Rochester. His main functions are to ensure the Destination Medical Center's development projects meet the energy and sustainability goals outlined in its development plan, convene the energy integration committee, and advocate for sustainability, health, and wellness issues throughout the community. For the city of Rochester, his main functions are to realize the goals outlined in the city's climate action plan and organizationally to reduce the city's environmental impact and support wider community sustainable behavior adoption. Kevin, we're glad you could join us today and uh, take it away. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of grounding on what the Destination Medical Center project is, and then I'll try to touch on um, the notes that John brought up himself around stakeholder engagement, intersectional collaboration, prioritization of projects and then financing for this, the work that we're doing here in Rochester, Minnesota. So a little bit about Rochester is that um, it is the home of Mayo Clinic. We're about a population of 120,000 people um, and Rochester covers about 55 square miles. 
um, in 2013, an economic development initiative and concept kind of bubbled up here um, and eventually was acted upon. Um, but understanding that with uh, Mayo Clinic's growth expectations here in Rochester, they were planning on growing by um, tens of thousands of employees over the next 20 years. Uh, quickly became understood that the city of Rochester didn't have the infrastructure in place in order to accommodate those growth needs. So how could we pair Mayo's interest in growing in Rochester with public infrastructure and then at the same time also recruit private development that could help hit on um, key insights in order to help improve the livability of the downtown area of the city of Rochester, kind of uh, combining an urban design uh, 21st century, 21st century view of what a downtown space should be with Mayo, Mayo's growth plans. Um, and out of this came the DMC project where we would leverage and requested 585 million of state funds um, to help recruit $5.1 billion worth of investment um, within this one square mile area of the downtown city of Rochester um, over a 20 year economic development project. Um, so Mayo itself, um, in that reference to 5 billion, um, will invest in, as part of this project, uh, is willing to invest 3.5 billion over that 20 years. Um, so the, really the remainder of what we're trying to recruit from private development is a $2.1 billion amount of investment. Um, up to last year, so about five years into the project, we've had 963 million, so we're about, we're on our way. Um, but still have a good amount of work to do over the remaining timeline here. Um, what the goals are of the project are to create a comprehensive strategic plan. So if you go to dmc.mn, there's a development plan listed um, and provided on the site. Um, it's not a short read, it's about 800 pages long, but if you're interested, uh, go for it. Um, but really at a high level, the goals here are in front of us of leveraging the public investment of 585 million to recruit that 5.1 billion of private investments, um, create approximately 30,000 new jobs. Um, the state was interested in particular because of the new net tax revenue, particularly with new employees that would come to Rochester would pay income taxes, which would help boost state tax revenue. Um, so generate seven and a half to 8 billion in new net tax revenue for the states county and the city of Rochester. And then ultimately all these kind of ladder up to achieving the best quality patient companion visitor employee and a resident experience we can. Um, so just kind of looking at the numbers in front of us a little bit, right? We're trying to recruit 5.6 billion of private investment between Mayo and other private developments, leveraging this public infrastructure funds of 585 million. And really the sources of that 585 million are broken up here. So the states of Minnesota is providing general aid in 327 million. Uh, there's a portion of funding from Olmstead County, which is a close partner of ours to provide 46 million. The state's also kicking in almost another 70 million to help build a new transit system for the, the downtown area of the city. And then the city itself um, is required to pr provide about 128 million in order to help create this 585 million total. So. To David's point earlier, there's a lot of players involved here and a lot of collaboration necessary to want to help get this funding in order, um, but then also figure out how best to use it to support uh, the downtown growth of the city, but also achieve the sustainability and energy goals for the downtown, which is really what my position's focused on. Um, so here's kind of a high level view of the downtown area of Rochester. Um, kind of the big areas for Mayo Clinic is they have one site here located in the subdistrict called Heart of the City, and then another called St. Mary's Hospital um, that's in this subdistrict called St. Mary's Place. This 585 million of public infrastructure can only be spent in this geographic area. So speaking of districts, this is where all the public infrastructure funds need to be directed. And really, as I mentioned, this is a one square mile area of a city out of 55 square miles. So out of this project um, and included in the DMC development plan are a range of sustainability goals and targets. Um, a number of them are, really, are listed here on this slide. Um, but overall, it's um, aiming to reduce the amount of resources that are consumed in this district over the 20 years of the project um, when considering energy, water, waste, um, and emissions. Um, achieving a single occupied vehicle reduction rate. So right now our city's at about a 70% single occupied vehicle rate, get that down to 50% or below by 2035, right? Which would be the 20 year timeline of the project. 
And then also the last one is kind of similar to creating a great experience. Realize the vision that was set for the project, which is to create America's city for health. Um, and we're kind of using a, a slightly different definition of what of health and more focused on health equity than kind of like eating good food and exercising, right? Um, but how all populations within the city can um, achieve similar health outcomes, which we know to be a big disparity both here in Rochester, but across the United States. So our progress to date, and this is just looking at the emission standpoint, is we do have a good amount of reduction per capita, tons per person, um, starting in 2007 to 2018. I don't know why that moved forward, but um, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Um, my slides are moving in the wrong direction. Here, yeah. 16% uh, reduction since 2007 and a 22% reduction in energy emissions since 2007. So our goal is right, to achieve an 80% reduction by 2050. Um, we're about 22% of the way there, at least on the energy emission side, and only 16% of the way of our way towards that goal on the total emission side of things. So we still have a lot of work to do over the time frame here um, in order to reach this target. Um, David brought up the concept of prioritization. Um, and this is a really important thing to keep in mind, for, especially for folks that are thinking about working in a sustainability area, is that there's no shortage of good ideas that you can spend your time working on. Um, but really what my part of my job is and focus is, is what are these large building blocks that we need to get into place that will then help frame future decision-making to set us on this path in order to meet this, these really ambitious goals and targets that we have. Um, so these are some of the building blocks that we're working on. Um, over the past five years, we've created a new comprehensive plan for the city of Rochester. We've undertaken a significant amount of transportation planning to understand how are we going to reach that single occupied vehicle reduction rate um, and create an integrated transit study and plan that will accommodate or basically introduce multiple modes to the downtown of the city, but also the city itself in order to encourage people to try other modes of transportation. And thinking, I don't know why my slides are advancing on their own. I'm sorry about that. Um, on the power and utility planning side of things, um, we do have a municipal utility, which is a benefit uh, that not many cities have. Um, but as a result of that, they themselves have created a plan to be 100% renewable by 2030, right? And, and thinking that half of our energy consumption in the city will now be from renewable resources over the period nine years from now, that significantly helps us work towards this uh, greenhouse gas emissions target that we have. On top of that, um, we're also looking at distributed energy opportunities and are in the middle of kind of a district energy planning for some city buildings that are looking for about a million square feet that are all looking for a heating and cooling solution um, in the next couple of years here. Um, beyond that, uh, looking at development, how we interact with private developers, we do have sustainable building policies in place. So any project that's requesting public financing has to meet certain energy outcomes um, and sustainability outcomes in order to receive that funding. Um, on top of that, uh, just kind of like the next step of the comprehensive plan, some zoning changes have been made in our city in order to make sure that transit-oriented development is happening in areas where we want to prioritize mass transit as well as an opportunity to densify areas of the city that's referenced as this R2X zoning here. Um, and then finally, we're look, working quite a bit with existing buildings to help continue to ratchet down efficiency or energy consumption within existing buildings in our city at the same time. So we're kind of like, imagine multiple spinning plates kind of at the end of sticks. And we're constantly spinning things and giving them attention as needed in order to reach these outcomes. Um, who do we work with? Uh, everything in my work is uh, collaboration. Um, and I'm sure most uh, others would feel the same way in the sustainability world. Um, the other kind of augment to that I would, I would add is a lot of my work is influence without any type of authority, right? We have, some, we have some considerable influence because there is this funding and financing that the DMC project holds. But at the same time, sorry, I'm laughing. It's just like these slides keep moving forward and I can't stop it. So I'm um, trying my best. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to basically encourage sustainability actions and behaviors to be taken in private development and our transit strategy and the public realm planning that's happening um, without any real authority over those processes, right? We're not the decision makers, uh, but we can help inform better decisions to be made. And that's really the role that we've been taking. 
um, to do that or kind of get on the same page as the decision makers. We spend a lot of time um, in developing these public-private partnerships. Kind of the Energy Integration Committee is one and the major stakeholders involved in that are basically the planning efforts in order to make sure that we're reading our, meeting our energy targets for the project. Uh, we've also put together a City for Health Steering Committee with a wide range of stakeholders and actors that are public health agencies, Mayo Clinic, health-focused nonprofits in the area, as well as equity-focused nonprofits in order to make sure that right we live up to that vision of creating America's City for Health. And then for a lot of the work we do, we, can, we work very closely with nonprofit partnerships. Um, this case study gets a little bit uh, into the more depth about what re robust stakeholder engagement means for our projects. And this is for the public planning project of a park downtown. So Heart of the City is located here. This is where the Center of Mayo Clinic is located. Discovery Walk is this linear park um, that we're working on the design of as, right now, or kind of right in the middle of it, in order to connect existing public park infrastructure in our downtown to another very large public park called Soldiers Field. Um, so we're starting to build out kind of an urban forest connection within our downtown that didn't exist previously, and try to make it interesting again to add to the downtown living, um, live, play, work environment that the DMC vision is trying to uphold. Um, so just some pictures of what this would look like, kind of the, the current view. Uh, we activated the space last year as part of the project development and what our aspiration is. Um, so really, this is a car dominated space. Our thought is to build out this sidewalk, eat up a lot of this public right away, reduce the travel lanes that are here, get, get rid of the surface parking and kind of the street level parking in order to make a much more active experience for this public realm project that would extend to kind of these tall buildings in the distance here, all the way through to where the picture is taken and then another couple blocks behind where this photo is taken. And in getting here, we, we understood that we were not, a lot of the projects and the public engagement processes we were working on, we were hearing from the same people over and over again, um, which wasn't really what we wanted. We wanted a park that reflected the community of Rochester as best it could. So we went on this path of creating an equitable engagement process. Um, and there's a number of differences in kind of what that means, but at, at its core, it kind of asked two questions and these slides will be available, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, but the two questions of who are the populations that are most impacted by this project and who, who currently has the least amount of influence in the process or implementation. Um, and to get at that, we did worked on the stakeholder power mapping analysis, which is one example of this is in front of you from groupmat.com. Um, and I learned about this from an urban sustainability directors network training. Um, so what we did was we filled one out for discovery walk process and prioritize the engagement um, of folks kind of in this upper quadrant that are highly impacted by public parks, uh, but currently have a low amount of influence, lower amount of influence on public decision-making processes. To do this, we then created kind of a co-designer role for the Discovery Walk projects and identified individuals through the help of nonprofit partners from the Diversity Council of Public Health Agencies um, to actively bring them into the design process and participate as co-designers and community networkers. And kind of out of this facilitated process where we had design studios together as one team with the co-designers co themselves, we then provided them two weeks in order to reach out to their communities, get broader perspective and feedback in order to help inform what a healthier park, more equitable park would look like for the city of Rochester. And I would say that this process um, was much different than any other public processes I've worked on in the 13 years at colleges or the city. And that the depth of insight that we received from these individuals and incorporated in the project um, was profound. Um, I would recommend, uh, we're starting to operationalize this for all of our projects because we have, have really understood kind of the depth and the importance of getting this, this input on these projects moving forward. So we kind of, we did have perspective on kind of three major parts, spatial elements, a lot. We were in Minnesota, so folks were like, we want to be able to go outside and feel comfortable in the wintertime. And particularly a lot of the immigrant communities from Northern Africa um, said right now there's no space that they can go to that feels warm or humid. So that kind of helped shape some of the design um, perspectives and incorporation um, as we worked through the design process itself. From a programmatic standpoint, a number of the co-designers shared that our public parks don't feel particularly welcoming to them now. Like they see open spaces and games that aren't familiar to them. And is there a way that they can, that familiarity can be 
broadened so that they recognize that this public space is meant for their enjoyment too. And then finally, we inevitably these conversations also translate to policy, which we also wanted to capture in order to help um, park policy moving forward. Um, and particularly, can they these park spaces be affordable and accessible, particularly to um, a refugee, immigrant communities, communities of color here in the city, so that they can rent these spaces for their major holidays? Um, right now, they're too expensive and aren't accessible to them. Um, right, so this kind of this policy input and feedback that we heard directly relates to this project, but is relatable to any other park that we already have in the city. Um, so it was also really helpful to understand what are some of these obstacles that are here in the way um, for people enjoying parks that we weren't, weren't aware of, I'm not aware of as a white person, um, white male. Uh, it was just really valuable insight in order to help shape how parks are being used now and in the future. So overall, the, the big outcomes that we learned was um, deeper level engagement with communities, right? Often cities have open houses on projects. We invite people in. We think it's equal or like, right, or equitable that the doors are open at a certain time. But I think we can all say that uh, just based on the people that show up every time, we're hearing from the same voices and it's not an equitable process. Um, the co-design process that I quickly spoke to here, I think helped build a lot of cultural diversity and inclusivity competency, both across the, uh, between the co-designers, between the co-designers and the project team, between the, and then also with the ultimate, like uh, directors of park departments and other departments within the city. And the learnings from this have applicability to both this one particular project, but to basically every other project that we work on in the city. And finally, uh, I'll say this again, we really had unique project insights as a result of this. Uh, the lived experience of these co-designers, their connections to the community, um, were never accessed here <laughs> as part of any other public project we worked on and would not be without having this depth and time in order to kind of speak to um, and allow the co-designers to also work with their communities as they define them in order to bring that broader perspective back in order to shape these kind of key design principles for this park. And really the outcome that we are pretty excited about is that processes like these will create a more inclusive and equitable project, um, but also for any other project that we work on in the future, which is why we're excited to leverage it again and have with a few other uh, infrastructure planning projects that we're working on. So I Pretty sure that's my last slide, um, but happy to answer any questions that come up. Sorry, I feel like I covered a lot in a very short amount of time there. No worries. Thanks, Kevin. So I see a few questions have come in um, and see if we can get to one or two of them. Um, one of the questions is asking how you've directly received input from diverse stakeholders. Um, Probably. Yeah, and I mean, I think my question, my answer to that would be we we really weren't, despite our best efforts, moving times of open houses until we worked on this co-design process, where we prioritize the involvement of, um, I would say, like non-traditional participants uh, identified through that stakeholder power mapping analysis, um, particularly in from communities of color, um, immigrant communities, refugee communities. Here, uh, we have a large Somali population that lives in Rochester. Um, and we really weren't until we ventured on this community co-design process. Um, so I think it was very helpful for us and excited to continue to leverage it. Yes. Um, all right, a more technical question. So going back to the per capita emissions reductions that you've seen since 2007, do you find that it's due to more regional or statewide reductions or is it more due to local factors or things under uh, the purview of the Mayo Clinic? Yeah, our electric grid is getting a little bit cleaner, but most of the reductions are actually from um, improvements in existing buildings. Um, Mayo Clinic has a very robust recommissioning program um, where they have saved, uh, I think it's over $26 million in operating utility operating expenses since 2010 as a result of commissioning um, and other kind of energy efficiency practices, lighting retrofits, duct sealing, things like that. Um, so a lot of the savings that are showing up citywide are largely driven by 
the actions of a few kind of very large organizations that exist within the city. Okay. All right. Um, and I guess we have time for one more. Um, looks like Heather has the question and let's see, she's asking, working with so how so the challenge for working with municipalities is working towards more sustainable practices and working with municipal employees who are concerned with how change will impact doing business as usual so the change that you're envisioning with mayo clinic how does that impact business as usual for your employees or for your programs it's a huge impact um but I think it speaks to the importance of collaboration and setting up kind of systems that you can constantly share ideas and make sure people are comfortable with the direction that things are headed. Um, I think what we are coming to realize is that business as usual has led to kind of the outcomes that we're trying to improve today, right? So the past actions of the 30 to the past 30 to 40 years um, have caused a lot of problems that we're now trying to solve around. Um, so I think, at least here, the working kind of assumption is that business at you, as usual might not be the best approach anymore. And what are some opportunities for more creativity? Um, and I think most people are on board with that. Um, mm -hmm. But right at, for those that aren't, if they're willing to talk about it and have a conversation, I think we can usually uh, start to see what some of those opportunities might be and why it's important to collaborate. Thank you for those words. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, muted by accident. <laughs> now we'll move on to our final speakers from today uh, who are joining us from Etna Borough, Pennsylvania. So Mary Ellen Ramaj is the manager of the Borough of Etna and a founding member of the Etna Community Organization, as well as the vice president of the board of the Etna Community Organization. Uh, Mary's immersed in the interconnection and intersection of community and local government that the eco-district process has deepened. So Mary is joined by Megan Tunyon, uh, an Edna Borough Council person and a founding member of the Edna uh, Eco-District and the Edna Community Organization. Originally an Edna Community Organization board member, uh, Megan has recently taken over as the executive director and will be responsible for fundraising, organizing, and implementing the projects outlined in the Edna Eco-District plan as well as the community outreach and the day-to-day -day operations. So Mary Ellen and Megan, thank you for joining us this afternoon and I'll hand it off to you. Yeah. Hi, well, thank you. Um, Megan and I are tag teaming today. Um, I'll be kind of giving you a little bit of the history of how we came to be on this path um, and um, our collaboration with and formation and finally becoming the first certified eco district in the world. Um, I'm, I think a lot of um, how we made it to that path was the foundation that was built out of necessity and need. Um, Etna is a really tiny town. We're eight tenths of a square mile. We're about seven miles north of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, we're at the bottom of a 67 square, square mile watershed. And as I said, the whole town is 0.8 tenths of a square mile. So we have a lot of things we had to deal with and um, come back from outside forces that really had an effect on our community. Um, so. You can just say next when you want me to advance, Mary Ellen. Okay, could you go, you go ahead. I'll just give a little motion. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We were kind of built on um, industry, really big, big industry. We actually at one time had the oldest running um, pipe milling service in the country, started in 1828. A lot of that happened around the river. Um, so, um, you know, our peak population at one time was 11,000 people, um, and now we're at 3,400. So you can see, um, you could change it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you can't see my hand. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, and then one of the other things that happened to us as an outside force is um, simply and plain and simple is transportation progress. And um, I like what I heard somebody else say here today about how 
without collaboration and without having everybody at the table, decisions get made that sometimes really have such an incredible effect. These are some state highway systems that were really just dissected our community. Um, this, this happened in the late 1950s and there have been improvements over the years. And the ultimate result was a loss of about 500 homes, um, which is a major part of our population. And it also cut communities, parts of our community off from the rest of the community. So um, between that and the loss of the steel mill, both of those kind of the steel mills, a lot of that happened right around the same period, um, which really left us in a um, very, very um, dire place. I live in Aetna. I've grown up in Aetna. Um, I've actually worked for the community for 44 years. So my perspective is really interesting and actually sort of a blessing because when I was small, I, I was there when the vibrancy was here and there were people everywhere, but then I saw the decline, the steady decline and the effect that these things had over years and years. And so it's really great to be able to still be here and see a, a set of place where we're changing how we look at our community um, and how others see our community. Does it change? Um, this is, um, I, I explained to you about the watershed. Um, you know, we have a history of flooding here in our community. A lot of it's simply the fact that we were 25% of the community was built in the floodplain, dense urban community. Um, we're also at the bottom of the watershed. Urban sprawl over the decades um, upstream of us in the watershed has been incredible. You know, we've, we've lived in a period and I've, I've walked um, worked through a period where people upstream of us, you know, were getting eight, ten thousand dollars to have a sewer tap um, that came through our community and flooded basements in our community. So, it's such a such an incredible challenge. And um, our last flood was in 2004. Twenty five percent of our community was flooded. Four hundred homes. Two hundred of those homes had first floor flooding. So it was catastrophic. The building I'm in right now had seven feet of water in it. So here we were, um, we had 400 homes and businesses that needed us to respond to and yet ourselves, we were completely incapacitated. I like to say it was a pivotal moment in our community because for decades we lived in our little silo and we just pointed upstream and said, everybody's, you know, flooding us and you know, then 2004 hit and our neighbors were the first people here, those upstream communities. And we kind of got on a path of looking at things in a different way, if you could switch. <laughs> um, and that's when we started realizing that we needed to work on things from within ourselves instead of expecting others to help us. That there were things that we could do. We were built in the floodplain. Um, you know, we're combined sewer system, which means all that water is going into the same system as our sanitary sewers. And um, that can't be good, especially with all the upstream development. So we started looking at stormwater first as how we can, what can we do here in this tiny little place? Um, our, our demographics had changed dramatically, our financial system dramatically from the result of these floods and job loss and property loss. Um, so we ended up working on and we in 2014 we adopted what is a green master plan for our community and that is our number one thing everything we do in our community we look at stormwater first. Um, you're looking at a very urban downtown commercial business district and a lot of roof area we started our projects fulfilling our projects in the business district because they had the lar largest roof area and what you see is. Um, the beginnings of a project where we were disconnecting the roofs from the downspouts and putting them into an infiltration bed in our sidewalks, which is a little scary. We had a lot of buildings from the 1800s, 1900s that had sandstone foundations. And I am so proud of the business people in our community who said, okay, let's, let's do it, you know? <laughs> and so a uh, little bit on the right, you'll see there's a uh, great system. There's a beautiful snaky Drake, great, it goes all the way down the street and catches the stormwater from the rooftops from the sidewalks and puts it in an infiltration bed so that it can infiltrate naturally and mimic how water is supposed to act. Next. 
Um, I'm going to try to go fast here. And these are some other projects we did. We started looking at our community from a different perspective, not not all the bad things that happened, but what can we do to change them? A lot of what you see here were vacant lots, buildings that had been abandoned. Um, on the very left is the Garden of Etna. That was uh, built in 2011. It was the municipal building in 1868. It was condemned <laughs> and torn down. <laughs> and it is now a community garden that, like I said, 2011, we put in. 16 residents have beds there. Four beds are dedicated solely to the food bank in our community. The uh, top picture on the in the center is a rain park. That was a hotel that was torn down, uh, had been abandoned, and now all the water in the second phase of our streetscape um, is um, piped right to this rain garden. So um, that removes that project alone moves about removes about 800,000 gallons from our combined sewer system. Uh, we began a rain barrel program, encouraging our residents to get rain barrels, disconnect their systems. We provide an incentive for them to do that. They get a discount on their sewer bill. Um, on the very bottom is uh, we were we had to do a stream bank restoration project after the flood of Ivan. And as I was going down there repeatedly with the engineer, I saw so many so much evidence of people coming here. And yet it was a terrible place to walk. There was scrap iron, scrap metal. It was um, steep slope. So um, we worked with the Department of Environmental Protection in the state and said, you know what, if we're going to restore this stream bank, why don't we make this a safe place for people to walk and let them get down here without um, as many hazards and uh, obstacles in their way. And I can tell you that that project was from 2006. That's the most up to this point, that's been the most popular project in our community. And so we saw how we do have things here that we need to look at in a different way. We've been looking at them the same way for decade upon decade. Next, <laughs> talking as fast as I can because I really want to get to um, Megan here. This is uh, phase two of our streetscape. Again, we disconnected all the downspouts, all the rainwater. They go into infiltration tanks. It's a little over a million gallons um, in phase two that we were withhold from our combined sewer system. Again, these are from our green infrastructure projects and our green master plan. Next, um, along the way, we, we all started to realize, you know, we in order to really look at our community in a different way, we need to do comprehensive planning. And we did something really unique and it really started off for one reason and one reason alone, and that was money. We wanted a new comprehensive plan. We didn't have the money to pay for the planning process. It's expensive. Our next door neighbors, which are Millville and Sharpsburg, were in the same position as we were. So we joined together. There was multi municipal funding to pay for your comprehensive plans. Um, that plan was adopted in 2014. It's called River Bend. Millville and Sharpsburg are very similar communities like ours, demographics wise, along the river, highway issues, railroad issues. So we did that together. Um, and you can go ahead. And one of the things that came out of that. Um, is um, our new zoning map that we share that was adopted in 2016, 20, and it revised in 2018. But we started working together and rezoning by doing this <clears throat> multi municipal zoning and sharing a zoning map. Suddenly, we didn't have to include everything in our tiny little eight tenths of a square mile. We were able to spread that out over three communities. And in the process, a really strong relationship developed, a collaboration. So we started talking about eco district work. Millville, one of the communities in the um, tri eco district, had started that process long before. And they said, you know what, guys, you are constantly doing things that are sustainable and eco practices. So let's start working together. We ended up, uh, we spent about 14 months talking about proposals and what we would want to do, including eco district formal um, planning and education. We were awarded the three communities together $2.3 million in um, funding from a foundation in Pittsburgh. Um, the direct, you can see right here, collaboration. We don't work together on the zoning. We don't work together on the comprehensive plan. We don't get to this place where we could go to a funder and said, we want all our communities to be healthy. Next, <laughs> I'm getting to where 
Um, and this is our biggest project out of it. And you know, you can see on the left, this was the remnants of an industrial piece of property in our community. And we looked at this for 50 years with nothing but heartache to say, what could we do here? We can't do anything here. Um, well, I'm proud to say we're in phase two of what you see on the right, um, which is an Aetna Riverfront Park and trail. It's gonna connect to us um, the Great Allegheny Passage and the Three Rivers Heritage Trail is what we're working on. We used a big part of the funding from that um, Henry Hillman Foundation. This is a $2 million project. We've gotten grants, state, federal, local, 300 from the foundation. And we finally saw that when you look at things a different way and when you collaborate and when you join forces that as tiny as we are, as, um, we're not very rich community financially, but we are rich in people, we are rich in resources, and we are very rich in dedicated uh, residents. And with that, I'm going to introduce you to one, and that is Megan Tunon. Oh, here's the end. This was um, one of my favorite, I'm sorry, my part. This, this new gateway sign kind of says everything. This is made out of core 10 steel, where we're marrying our past to what our future is right now, more community matters. And um, because of all the work that's been going on in the stream, we now do have a blue heron. And I can tell you when I was a child, my parents had to take me out of this community to, for me to actually witness and experience anything like that. And it was in a zoo or an aviary or a park that was far away from our urban industrial settlement. So thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce Megan. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Chinyan. Um, I am the executive director of the Aetna Community Organization. Um, we were a nonprofit that was formed during our Aetna Eco District process um, to help carry out portions of the Eco District work. Um, before I started this work, I was a high school English teacher, so I recognize that the language that we choose to use is really important. And I want to underscore throughout my portion of this presentation. Um, the words we choose can either be exclusive or inclusive. So one point that I want to make clear is that the language used in the Eco Districts Protocol and Handbook, even the word Eco District, is not designed for broad community adoption because we just don't speak like that. Um, part of the secret to our success here in Aetna and also in Millville and Sharpsburg, uh, which we measure in community participation and adoption, is that we translated the Eco District language into a more local understanding. So the process of translation began in Millville, where Evolve EA, who is an environmental planning and architecture firm based here in Pittsburgh, um, had been working with Millville residents to start a neighborhood scale sustainability initiative. Rather than going straight into planning, uh, Millville and Evolve EA began a series of educational sessions so that their residents could first gain a shared understanding of the issues before trying to solve them. So the community chose topics from the issues and challenges they were facing and understood very well. Uh, they identified six areas that truly impact their quality of life. These areas are water, energy, food, air quality, mobility, and equity. And by starting with education and by allowing the sustainability work to be grounded in issues affecting that community, and in words that they were accustomed to using, Millvale led our region in becoming the first community to establish an eco-district plan. So concurrent with the Tribro eco-district meetings that Mary Ellen um, alluded to that occurred over a 14 month period, a very small group of people in Aetna started sitting around dining room tables and meeting in coffee shops and asking, could we pursue eco-district work? Uh, do we have what it takes? And we really didn't know if people would participate. We didn't even know if there'd be funding for all the work that would be involved, but still we believed in it and we started without any funding. So each month the participants grew, it started with like five people and then 10 and 15, 20. We were slowly growing a grassroots team in Aetna by building trust. And we formed a multi-generational team, which was very important to our community. So after months of this, small scale groundwork, we realized that the word was getting out and momentum was building. So we decided to get lawn signs and post fires. Uh, we rented the fire halls so that we could have a large scale community meeting. And we had no idea 
anyone would show up, but 110 people came through the door and uh, they stayed for a two hour meeting. And after that, the residents exited feeling more hopeful than they had in a long time. So this kind of became the norm for us. Over the next two years, we held 36 free, open to the public, all ages events in every type of setting, indoors, outdoors, a spaghetti dinner in a church basement, a pool party, um, or on the street at the arts festival. We just went to where people were to get their input and also to encourage them to get involved. So our eco district work wasn't focused on just the plan or the establishment of metrics. It was the, rather the process by which residents were empowered to lead the community. Um, when the major grant money arrived, we were able to hire Evolve and begin with a more robust process like in Millvale that began with education. So each month we held a large scale community meeting on a particular quality of life issue. And then a week later, people who were particularly passionate about those issues um, formed a working group to develop the vision around that area. And these groups became known as the champions groups. Over six months, we had champions for each area, water, air quality, energy, mobility, food, and equity. The leadership circle was so broad at that point that no single person was in charge of our eco district. The champions groups um, kept meeting and we allocated $2,000 to each group of champions to do a smaller project. So they held cooking events, created walking trails, created a sustainability fair. Uh, we were doing things like competitions for home energy savings and community-wide cleanups. Uh, we had teenagers learning about installing solar panels. And as you can see on the left, we installed a solar charging station to demonstrate the impact. So we were implementing and activating while planning so that residents could feel the positive change and visualize what was being discussed. We called these small wins and they kept the interest, participation and engagement going throughout the planning process. Uh, we continue to work with these locally selected issues and we recognize that in order to pursue eco district certification, the work of translation would need to occur. So Evolve created a document that helped move from the local issues into the eco district framework. We were running two concurrent processes. Um, one path was the local planning and the other one was certification. And we paid for seven community members to obtain the accredited Eco Districts AP to help with that. Um, we did these processes simultaneously so that they could inform one another. The road was arduous, uh, but the payoff was rewarding. It was late nights spent reviewing massive PDFs and spreadsheets and the exhausting work of hosting community meetings every month, sometimes more than once a month. Um, I want to point out that on the left over here, that's our mayor and council president doing dishes in the kitchen at the fire hall following our planning meetings, which they did every month. Um, and on the right uh, is contrasted by our moment in the spotlight. Um, Aetna is so often seen as a disadvantaged community, you know, Rust Belt, low income, flood prone. So to be recognized at the National Eco District Summit as the first in the world to achieve something was a feeling that is hard to put into words. So we felt the pride of not giving into the narrative. Um, as Mary Ellen said, we're changing the narrative. So flash forward to 2020, uh, four months after our plan was published and our certification was complete, these multiple health crises began crushing us. So some of our long-term efforts had to be postponed so we could address the immediate needs of our residents. Uh, when businesses closed and people were out of work, we started a dinner program where we paid local restaurants to create $8 meals and provided them free to residents. Um, when an act of racism, hate speech, and threats of violence occurred at the site of our youth baseball fields um, following the murder of George Floyd, we counteracted these actions with a public mural project um, promoting a diverse and inclusive community, as you can see on the right. While these crises rage on, we take a look back at our work um, that we had done with a fresh perspective and we recognize how relevant it still all is. Uh, now more than ever, we need a public space where we can build community. That's why in November, Edna Borough and ECO uh, started on the first priority project of the Edna Eco District Plan, known as Eco Park. It's the redevelopment 
of a highly visible green space with a substantial stormwater management feature, of course. Um, it's why we're actively um, designing the Aetna Center for Community um, and Library, which was the number one priority project of the Aetna Eco District Plan. And as you saw in Mary Ellen's presentation, in conjunction with the streetscapes and the riverfront uh, park, Aetna's future is changing. Um, we no longer are victims of our watershed. We've used our challenges to create community assets. Yes, we face economic and environmental threats, and we always will, uh, but we're building res resiliency in an equitable way so that our residents can thrive and live healthy, fulfilling lives. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I hope that this presentation was inspiring to you as it was for us to create it. Uh, we haven't previously given a version of this presentation before, so it was very generous of you uh, to invite us. Um, and now if there's any questions, I think we can answer some of those. Thank you, Edna Burrow. Uh, so the work that you've been doing and the collaboration that you've managed to gain from community members and your sister Burroughs has been incredibly inspiring. Um, but looking at the time, I think we might have to wrap it up here. So for anyone out there, feel free to reach out to one of the webinar co-sponsors to get in touch with any further questions. Um, I wanna give a sincere thanks to each and every one of our panelists for sharing their work and insights. And thank you to everyone on the line for joining us, uh, especially for the past month when we've had our last webinars. This is the last webinar in our five-part series, but feel free to look up uh, past webinar recordings and speaker information um, on the Hickson Center website, which uh, is in the chat now. So thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. <laughs>